Hello, it's David. Now in a previous video I had a look at this uh, PLCC to uh, dip adapter for the CPU socket of the Atari STE. Now this, as I showed, takes a 68-pin PLCC uh, socket, uh, builds a plug for it and connects it to a DIP64 uh, socket that a um, an old style uh, DIP64 uh, 68000 can go into. And I did mention briefly in passing in the last video that this is a P16 ending chip number. Now that means that this can run at 16 megahertz. Now the ST is only 8 megahertz, so given I love a new adapter, I wondered if there was some little hack that we could do to um, to try employing this uh, uh, the full potential of this um, 16 megahertz machine. So today, what I'm attempting to do is, uh, with the help of a little CPLD development board, implement a bit of clock switching on the STE and see what sort of performance benefits, if any, we get with a 16 megahertz switching clock. This is just a small Xilinx dev board off eBay, only a couple of pounds. Uh, this is an XC9572 CPLD, very, very small, not a lot of logic uh, able to be contained within there, but we don't need much for this. Pretty much all of the pins are uh, fanned out, and we've got some status LEDs on here, more than enough for our task. So I'm going to combine these two and a breadboard, a little bit of modification on this uh, CPLD adapter, sorry, this PLCC adapter, and we'll see where we get to. Okay, so how are we going to get our new 16 megahertz clock uh, into the chip without affecting the ST? And the obvious thing is that we've been given with this board a uh, Schmidt trigger. Get my last meter out. We've been given here a Schmidt trigger which takes the clock line from the PLCC socket, gives it a nice sharp edge and passes it through to our uh, dip socket. So uh, I think this is pin 16 here. There we go, we've got a short to, to that leg. And the input comes from uh, this pin over here on the, PL, on the um, PLCC, I think, which uh, goes to the middle leg on the Schmidt trigger. And there's no direct continuity between the uh, the clock pin here on the uh, the PLCC side and the clock pin on the dip side. No, it's nothing at sixteen. So we've already got isolation on this board. So all we really have to do is to pop off that, that little tiny, what is that, SOT23 package. We can then sniff the clock from one of these little pins down in here, I think it's this pin here. This one with the slightly uh, dog leg track coming into it, that I believe is the clock. Uh, we can sniff it from there and we can inject into the clock pin, which I think is pin 16, like I said. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yep, that's pin 16 there. So on the underside, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That one there, we could inject our clock in there. So a little bit of captain tape to protect the plastics, and then uh, a touch of uh, uh, liquid uh, flux, and then a heat gun at about 370 degrees. Just talk you through exactly what we've got going on here. So this is just a power regulation board. 
Uh, I'm, only, I'm using this just to convert the 5 volts, which I'm tapping off the, uh, the ST over here, convert the 5 volts down to 3.3 for my CPLD um, dev board. Over here, I've got my CPU multiplier. I'm using the CPU multiplier because it reduces uh, the chances of slow um, cycles. If we go too slow, the CPU um, stalls. Um, and just the clock switching technique that I've employed. Uh, I'm using my general clock switching technique, which injects basically slower, um, almost half um, frequency cycles um, to get the edges to line up. Uh, but there's only so low you can go, so this is just a way of reducing that. You could put a, a crystal in here, um, but you you just have to make sure that it was uh, you you switched. Um, uh, you didn't inject too slow a, a cycle when you switched. Anyway, so this is taking the uh, input uh, clock, and a copy of that is going into the CPLD. The output clock is basically doubled, so that's 16, but in sync, and that's going into the CPLD. I've got an AS line, this is the address strobe line, which is coming off here. Okay, I'm going through an oscilloscope as well to monitor it. That's coming into the CPLD. The result of that is visible down here on the oscilloscope. So what we've got here on the top row is the address strobe, and then down here we've got the uh, the actual clock that's going through. So if we just run stop that, there we go. So we can talk about this quickly. So what we see here at the start of the screen We've got a couple of 16 megahertz, uh, 16 megahertz cycles. Here comes the address strobe. So we pick up on the address strobe, and you see it goes into this wait state. See, this is the slow bit. This is almost half uh, the speed of the of the A. So it's almost a four megahertz. So we have to be careful. If we drop too low, it won't work. So we go into a uh, a four megahertz wait and switch to to eight. And of course, this would normally all be wait states. So we're not losing any time here. Uh, we'd normally be just in a couple of dead cycles anyway, whilst waiting for the RAM to respond. So that's not too bad. And then by the time we get back to the eight, our bus cycle has finished, and we can switch back to sixteen. Now, because another one starts straight away, we only actually get we don't really get any huge performance benefit here because we've effectively got one, two, three, four, effectively four cycles per. Uh, memory access, which is 100% speed. Now, if we can catch it when there's not a sequential memory access, I suppose. Let me try running a uh, CPU test on GenBench. We might be able to catch a. Uh, there we go. There's a, a cycle that doesn't happen immediately. So here's the negative edge of uh, address select. We go 16, 16, 16, wait, 8, 8, 8, back up, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. And this is where we see our speed benefit. This is all at 16 megahertz, and that's doing the actual mathematics in the processor, and that's where we see that 189% come from. So here's the end result of uh, our uh, 16 megahertz uh, switching. Um, and you can see, surprisingly, the figures, well, not surprisingly, but perhaps if you weren't expecting it, surprisingly, the figures are not that great overall. We get a, a total o uh, overhead figure here of 113, but I, you can take that with a pinch of salt. Let's look at the individual things to see where you get the benefit. And the f obvious one is the integer division. 189%, slight overhead for the clock switch. That's to be expected. That's pretty good. Everything else is basically between uh, 100 and 100. I think the best other one there is 109 for the uh, the graphics. So the key thing here is the ROM and the RAM speeds. Now I happen to know that because I've got EPROMs in here, I could actually clock ROM accesses faster. That way you can get a, a, a speed boost in the 120s. But uh, that's yeah, that, that that's cheating. It, it basically only uh, it, it's not going to work for everybody. Um, 
But this is the kind of figure you get. You see, well, this is the, the, the problem with just boosting CPU speeds. You don't really see much performance benefit. We'll run it through front bench one more time. Uh, that's where you'll get a, a, a really good feel uh, for the, um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the general use case. Uh, but the key thing with all kind of boosters is that you do need to have a fast access to memory. Um, I know what Exos does a lot is that he enforces um, uh, fast ROM. For general desktop uses, uh, fiddling with the ROM access speed is uh, really helpful. But if we wanted to see general across the board uh, improvements, what we need to do is to get on any uh, board that we, uh, we put in place here, we would need to get uh, extra RAM in here and then add it with um, uh, add it as alt RAM. And because of the way the 68000 works, there's only uh, 23 uh, address uh, address lines, 24 bits, one is inferred. Um, that means that uh, it can only address 16 megabytes of RAM. Two of those megabytes are reserved. The top megabyte is reserved for uh, hardware access. The megabyte below that is reserved for uh, ROM access. So, like with the Falcon, 14 is the maximum we could get to. Four is drivable from the onboard memory management systems, which means we can, in theory, add another 10 megabytes of fast uh, alt RAM. Uh, and this would be basically what you, what you would have to do. You'd have to load this up with some extra RAM. Doesn't need to be 10. Uh, you know, if you could sneak an extra four meg in there, uh, it would make a huge difference to desktop systems like Mint. And the things like Frontier you'd see would run a lot faster. The majority of games though, not going to make any difference at all because fundamentally they aren't happy with you using normally they're not happy with you using all them okay so here we are in front bench and this is uh, the stock STE 8 megahertz uh, front bench is a, uh, a, uh, a creation of my own it's a hack of uh, the uh, um, shareware version of frontier to include a frames per second counter and uh, a frame count between two parts of the introduction so here we're just seeing a snippet of the standard 8 megahertz, a slow bit where it descends, the, the ship descends through the sky and it gets to about three frames per second, dropping to two right at the end. So we'll cut to the 16 megahertz version now and we'll see uh, what sort of improvement we get. And bear in mind we saw figures sort of in the 103% region, not expecting anything dramatic here. So as it descends, uh, yep, sure enough, three frames per second, about the same, it was, it, was three before just down to two back to three again will it be two when it lands yep so broadly similar on uh, that slow descent uh, next we've got our uh, running space battle we're going to uh, shoot through the uh, uh, the ring space station and uh, this is back on the stock version and you can see we're at five four three fps just as we go through and here we are 16 megahertz same scene uh, coming towards the uh, uh, the ring and we're seeing okay we're at six we're four five four three as we cut through it okay so that was actually a little bit quicker on the uh, the 16 megahertz so here we are now just coming up to the end you can see the frame counter here is ticking up 790 ticked over to uh, to 800 and as the explosion happens we drop to three frames per second uh, back up to four so three at the moment back up to four uh, and here we go, as we come to the end of the uh, introduction, there we are, we lock at 857 frames. So 857 frames is what you would normally get on a stock STE running at uh, 8 megahertz for the introduction. So back to the 16 and we'll just uh, watch the same scene. 6, 5, 3, okay it does drop down to 3 again, but it was up at 5 before. So yeah, a little bit faster. And here we see, look, we're already up past 900 frames and... There we go, 948. So it's 948 frames for the 16 megahertz version compared to, I think, 857. That's roughly a 10% boost. That's all we see is a 10% boost with this hack. So there we go. This was uh, just a bit of fun, but uh, it does show uh, the CPU switching can work, uh, but its effects are very, uh, marginal without um, some additional memory. Fast RAM would really help, but there aren't many games that support it. Frontier is an obvious exception. And fast ROM 
would really help for desktop use. I think on the balance, I'd rather have the extra RAM, however. So if I were to do anything like this uh, for real, it would include a, an alt RAM, a fast alt RAM component to the card. Thanks very much for watching, and see you next time.